call this regular workshop meeting with Jacksonville City Council to order. Council, you have a, a copy of the proposed agenda for this workshop, and I would like to add as item one tonight, uh, we're going to move one to two. I want to move one to two and add an item. Uh, number one is being a uh, grant, uh, and I'll give you that information here in a minute. I'm going to let Glenn present the information on the grant, if you don't mind, sir. That's a you want to go ahead and make the motion to approve okay. the agenda? So moved. And with the approval of the changes. Approval of the agenda, agenda with okay. the changes second. As presented. A motion and second. Any discussion? Here none. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? All right. Now, Glenn. Thank all you. right. Good evening, Council. Uh, we've just been made aware of today of a grant um, that is due on September 1st. And it's an opportunity for uh, money that will not have to be matched. And we knew that y'all would not want to pass up this opportunity at least without not having heard about it. So I want to ask Anthony and, uh, and Lily to speak about this grant as they were the ones that found and have now researched it as it was so they can talk about it. Thank you, Glenn. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, we are in a very unique situation today where we have appeared to be awarded about $95,000 in grant funding that we didn't even apply for. So... That's a, that's a good situation to be in, of course, but being that it's so new, we do not have all of the details for you as to what the money is for, you know, what the scope of the project would be that we might fund with it, etc. But based upon our research, it appears to be a very good opportunity for us to look at some downtown revitalization efforts. Uh, the money comes from, where is it? Rural Economic Development, Department of Commerce. The Department of Commerce mm -hmm. and there does not appear to be any local match for the funding and the guidance for the grant program is relatively loose mm -hmm. so really what we wanted to do tonight is just to inform you of this opportunity and get your concurrence in our ability to continue to pursue it uh, and if we find that it's a good opportunity maybe come back to the council and talk about what we might want to do with the funding but the deadline the to deadline, file is yes. September 1st, September. so they will not meet until not after meet. that date. Right. So if we find that it's not something that, if it's not what we think it is now, we won't do it. But if it's something that appears as that what, what the preliminary research has done that is a way to get $95,000 worth of streetscape or wayfinding or something done, mm -hmm. then we're going to proceed on. Yes. And we'll make you aware of it and communicate to you as we go forward. Yes. And what were some of the examples of things that... That we can do. Mm -hmm. um, planning costs that will produce a, a plan, a streetscape design, implementation, public infrastructure such as water, sewer, lighting, digital infrastructure, facade or building improvements, wayfinding signage or art and cultural installations. And I did receive an email just as I was walking in from... Um, Melody Adams, the, the, the director of the program, and she pretty much said just we could be as flexible as we need to be. And this is just ideas. We're not limited to this. The only thing we cannot do is pay for uh, operating staff salaries, entertainment, and food. But she pretty much said we have free reign to pretty much put together a project for downtown. And it's a very simple um, two-page proposal that we will submit by September 1st, which describes the project, the budget for the project, and what we hope to accomplish along with a picture of the project site. And then we would have to um, <coughs> sign contracts, which would come uh, October 1st, and then complete the project by March 31st of 2017. And interestingly enough, once the contracts are signed, they are going to cut us a check for $94,000 to go ahead and fund the project, and we just report out after the fact that we've accomplished it. Let me so, make sure I got this correct yes. here. Now, you don't have to specifically <coughs> say what your project we is do. going to be. We, we, we do. do. And we need time to, we need time we need time to develop that. Yes. Right. So we're asking tonight if y'all give us approval to go ahead and work toward this and, and keep you informed. Yeah, it's, it's our plan as staff to get together on um, Monday morning and once Dr. Woodruff gets back and come up with, and, we, and it can be also more than one project. It doesn't have to be one, it could be multiple. So there's opportunities to do a lot of great things in downtown. We just need to get, a, get it a, agreed upon and get a budget for it and get this turned in and, and start getting the RFPs out and hiring people. And it's a very fast track. Like I said, we just got this today. And so... You're wanting council direction. Jerry, you had a question? I understand the, the problem, but I would, rather than staff picking out the project of the options listed, I'd 
asked that they give council some alternatives. Mm -hmm. We sure. could do yes, this, we absolutely. could do that, and send that out as an email and a report, then let us make that decision either by email or whatever to file the application. Totally agree. Yes, absolutely. And, and Mayor, of the projects that, that Lily referenced here, um, I believe you're aware that we've been working on a lot of that type of, of, of stuff already. On this so list. <laughs> I, I don't believe that we're going to be pulling something out of the air and just presenting to you as a new idea, a new concept that hasn't been vetted. Mm -hmm. I think what we will probably do are pull together things that we've already been working on that just aren't currently funded and try to move those forward with the funding that's available with this program. Yes. Thank you for that. Eric. Yes, sir. Yes, that is what I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, they're looking for some direction. Anybody want to? I'll make a motion to uh, authorize them to move forward the planning and come back with council with option. Second. Any further discussion? <coughs> Hearing none, all in favor? <coughs> uh, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you, council. Thank we'll thank report you. to keep you informed on that. Well, next, um, we come into a conversation about um, FEMA maps, and um, most people would roll their eyes and get sleepy at this point, uh, but uh, many of you know what the impact is of the FEMA maps and the flood control maps and things such as that. So I'm going to change places here and let um, Ryan introduce our, our speaker this evening and um, our consultant, and then we'll be back up with the recommendation that Richard has put forward to you. The on the slide, sure. Thank you, Mayor and Council. As you all will recall, back in March of this year, as you authorized us to move forward with um, seeking out um, Mr. Fran Way and his uh, company, Applied Technology and Management, which is an international company. Uh, Fran is based out of the Charleston, South Carolina office, to look at, um, basically analyze the initial four terabytes worth of data that's been provided by North Carolina Department of Public Safety, the flood mapping office up in Raleigh. And Fran and his colleagues there at ATM have done so. And he's going to basically give council a presentation tonight that identifies a lot of the things that were contained in that, that report, the 52-page report that you received last week with your uh, agenda packet. And I'll turn this over now to Mr. Fran Way. He's a professional engineer. And uh, walk you through that, and we'll be looking forward to any um, questions that you may have we'll try to clear it up it's not an easy subject matter it's kind of hard to get your you know get your head wrapped around so Fran White with ATM hi uh, as Ryan said uh, we're a coastal engineering firm we work specialize in the southeast uh, we successfully helped the town of Wrightsville Beach with their uh, FEMA map appeal about a year ago we're working on another FEMA map <laughs> appeal for a, a, a aquarium structure in St. Augustine right in Florida right now and then we do a lot of other FEMA letters and map revision FEMA modeling uh, FEMA support uh, so that, that's kind of where we are and we do a lot of computer modeling uh, just to kind of on the big picture FEMA mapping they remap every about 10 to 15 years the existing Oslo County maps are from 2005 uh, and so we're kind of right in between that 10 to 15 year schedule. Uh, the major areas right here, this is the overall schematic. Uh, the, v, the VE zone, we don't have to worry about that. The difference between the V zone and the A zone is a three foot wave height, significant wave height. There's no uh, V zone uh, areas in the, in the city. Therefore, we don't really have to worry about that and we won't. But you see down here, here's the, the base flood elevation. And that's what we're going to be talking about a lot. And the, the coastal AE zone is, is, you know, really what we're going to focus on here. There is no LIMWA. That's a coastal thing. We're not going to talk about that. And then obviously the X zone. And this is, if, if you're going in, you see that 100-year storm, if you're in the X zone, you're dry. Uh, your, your land is dry uh, and your structure is dry. The A zone is where you're going to have you're going to have some wave effects and you're going to have surge and all that combines to the, to the base flood elevation. And then the SAF, there's going to be lots of acronyms. I, I apologize in advance. The special flood hazard area. And this area is kind of, you know, this is where anywhere over here is where you need flood insurance. Uh, we'll go to the next one. <coughs> the existing maps for the, uh, for the city. 
basically you can see all the AEs on this plot. There's uh, the AEs over here, AE2, AE3. The AEs is we're in the, that coastal AE zone where there, there are some small waves under 100 year conditions. And the three is indicates a base flood elevation of three. And from here on out, whenever we're talking elevations, vertical elevations, they're all relative to the NAVD88, which is North American Vertical Datum of 88. It's basically mean sea level. You can, everyone just think of it as, as mean sea level. But so this three feet means there's a three foot uh, BFE there. You can see up river, there are some, some sixes and sevens and some of these smaller creeks uh, where you can see, you know, some 14s, 15s. Uh, so basically there's, there's, you know, the city of Jacksonville gets affected by coastal storm surge that comes from, you know, obviously from the coast. And then there's also these smaller rivers and creeks that have their own watersheds that have their own hundred year storm conditions. Uh, and then obviously Jacksonville is right there where they're feeling both those effects. The draft preliminary maps are, uh, they have been out this year. Uh, in Onslow County in general, and actually the entire coastal counties of, of North Carolina, uh, in general, you see along the open coast, along the barrier islands, you see a decrease in the, in the BFEs. Uh, the storm surge is going down, the 100-year storm surge. Unfortunately, in all the kind of estuary systems in here, and actually Sneeds Ferry looks pretty bad, but they've got the, the large, they've got about a 10-foot increase in some areas. But it, the estuaries are where you're seeing significant increases. There's fours, fives, sixes. So that, that, that base flood elevation is going from a four to a 10. Uh, and even in Sneeds Ferry, it's going up 10 feet itself. Uh, so in general, there are a lot of happy homeowners along the coast, but we're finding a lot of the estuarine shorelines and anyone near these estuaries, uh, it, you know, they're, they're, they're seeing some, some detrimental effects. So basically on the mainland side of the intercoastal waterway mm -hmm. and up the rivers and creeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and then Ryan's been uh, coordinating with NC FMP, the flood mapping partners, it's, it's uh, a few agencies within North Carolina, and they are tasked with remapping and, and doing all the technical studies, and then they you know, coordinate with FEMA with their results and everything. For the, the city preliminary overview, uh, the, the reds here are increases in the, the special flood hazard area changes. And then the blues are decreases. And as you can see, <clears throat> it's mostly red. Uh, it's, there's a significant increase in the flood zone areas, the 100 year flood zones. And there's, there's some small areas where there are some decreases, but in general, it's, it's a significant increase. These are the preliminary <coughs> maps. And if you recall before, this area down here was AE2, AE3, and now it's an AE10. <coughs> So that's the surge is going up about seven feet. The, uh, the base flood elevation goes from about a three to a 10. Uh, and it's, it's basically 10 in most of these areas. And then as I, I talked about before, some of the smaller creeks, which aren't, sh aren't shown here, they're, they're, they're even higher as well. Just, just to acclimate council, you see the bypass here on the bottom. And then basically this is downtown, just to orient you. And here's a, a, a comparison, side-by-side -side comparison of existing versus preliminary. The red means you're in an AE zone, and uh, the yellow, and when it's on the aerial, the colors can get a little messed up, but the yellow is the 500-year flood zone, which is kind of a, it's called a shaded X zone. That's really not part of the uh, special flood hazard area, so we're not really going to talk about that 500. They, they map it, but they don't use it, the 500-year. So we're just really concerned about the red. And you can see here this, this entire area, uh, Court Street, uh, Wardola, uh, this, this entire area is, is uh, an AE-10 now, when it was basically an X zone. It, well, it, the existing wise, it's an X zone. And with the, you know, some spots right along the shoreline that were, you know, that, that were the, the AE zones. Uh, can you, just for our viewers, yes? can you explain what the AE-10 means? So AE means there, in terms of you're going to have uh, storm surge, and then you'll have wave heights less than three feet, 
to that all contribute to that base flood elevation of 10. Uh, so the AE, uh, there's the VE, which is the, the V zones, and those are the ones you usually see along the coast. And those have wave heights, 100 year wave heights greater than three feet and some element of storm surge. Would, so, would, it, would it be fair to say that uh, AE 10 then means that, it, that you'd expect a worst case, a 10 foot high above your normal yes. sea level? Yes. So, so uh, anybody, mm -hmm. you know, if you're not, these, these folks are, are anywhere from 10 to one or two, whatever, but, but yep. a 10 foot. Let me, let me yep, give council an example. The, the base flood elevation for the marina that council purchased right on the water is currently an AE4. And that's about, based on survey data that we had prepared for the city, the floor there is at about four feet. So the new flood maps are saying that that's going to have six feet of water inside the building. As it relates to houses, let's go to a house on Court Street. If Court Street, let's say you have a house on Court Street, the front yard is at an elevation four. And let's say you have a two foot high foundation. So your finished floor is at a six. If they, with this maps, it's going to go to a 10, that means they're a minus four. And that means that if they have a, a federal um, insured mortgage, that insur the, the mortgage, the bank, the lending institution is going to make you carry flood insurance. And if you're a negative, a negative four, and you'll see later in the slideshow, that may mean on a $200,000 house that you have to have about a $13,000 annual flood insurance premium. So we're talking money. What, what these folks are going to have to pay for flood insurance compared to a $400 policy when you're three foot above. So it may not be in a flood zone today, so you don't have to have flood insurance. Now they're going to require it if you have a mortgage, and if you are negative, those premiums are going to be substantially higher. And, and I'll just, uh, I'll know that all the, the mapping was done based on uh, 2006 LIDAR data. LIDAR data is light and data ranging. Uh, it's, it's been much better than what they used for the 2005 maps, which were from 90s, 1990s topography data. And basically they just found that 10 foot contour line and, and kind of delineated it based on that LIDAR data. And so this area, you know, based on LIDAR data, this area down here is anywhere, you know, between 10 feet and four feet elevation. So they're under varying levels of water. They're saying that you're going to have 10 feet of water. Some people will be under six feet of water, some under five. There are actually a couple of little high spots here where they, they, you're going to, some areas are going to be dry in this area. Um, but so that, and basically just based on that 2006 LIDAR data, they find the 10 foot contour and say anything under 10 feet is getting wet. So will that be an automatic change, Ryan, as soon as they adopt these? If let's say that we just move forward and we go through the adoption process and they become effective yes sir that's the new rules that will go by which means on court street so because what happens when someone can't afford the fifteen thousand dollar insurance increase because i have to walk away from their house uh, unfortunately you may have people that walk away from their homes and you don't think they'll be a huge impact in that whole oh, thing. Absolutely. Of course it will. That's, why, of course that's it is. why we're here and we've been rather adamant about we need to have these things looked at because one of the, and, and I'm going to steal some of Fran's thunder here, but one of the storms that the folks used for their validation model runs was Hurricane Fran. And they basically said that brought in an eight foot wall of water. And based on conversations that have been had, experiences here it didn't come up eight feet but that's what they use as one of their validation runs and then they ran 675 synthetic storm tracks with that what i'm going to say questionable input so if it's questionable input we said the output should also be questionable and that's the reason why we've we've sought ATM to look at the data provided and see what may be possible for council to look at. And one of the things that we looked at with the assistance of Parker and Associates and John Pierce's office, they have actual survey points 
on the ground throughout Jacksonville. And Fran looked at the actual surveyed elevation points versus the LIDAR data, and what we found is there's a half a foot difference. So right off the bat, we found a half a foot difference between the data that they're using and actual surveyed elevation points that the surveyor so graciously gave to us. And, and he'll get into that in a little bit here in a little while. But, you know, that's kind of one piece where we say, hey, well, if it's off a half a foot, you know, that could be a half a foot. Instead of a 10, you're talking nine and a half. You know, what else, you know, could there be? And, and we'll talk about that as we kind of move forward. And here's another image of uh, existing versus preliminary. And so we talked about there's, you know, two elements here. There's the, this flood hazard area is getting larger and it's also getting higher. Uh, and so that's basically, and this is another image of just where, where the new maps are. So there are some homes along the, along the shore that are in an AE three or four zone now. And then we have some other uh, many, many new homes that will be in newly mapped into into zones, and there will be significantly, uh, you know, pretty high BFEs. One of the things that we've seen presented was that for Jackson, where we've got 800 new structures being brought into the special flood hazard area, that's true. But those 500 others are also impacted because if they were already at a base flood elevation, let's say they were at plus three and you've just added seven feet, they're minus four. If I did that math correct, not my forte, but so they're gonna be impacted as well. So it's 1,366 structures in Jacksonville that are gonna be impacted potentially by these maps. And that doesn't include the undeveloped properties that let's say that we've got um, a subdivision or, or an area that could be developed um, for a subdivision. Well, let's use Laguna Bay across the river. Some of those lots are still available to be built. It's gonna impact how uh, those houses could be constructed. I dealt with the um, family lot one, Laguna Bay. I'm drawing a blank on their last name, um, but basically they were gonna have a living quarters on the bottom floor. And when they heard about the new maps, they talked with us and we looked at the information and basically what it boils down to is they're not going to be able to have a living space on that bottom floor. You know, they're going to have to go up another floor potentially. And those are some impacts to them as well, because that obviously may not be exactly what they wanted to do. That may cost them more money to not have a living space on the first floor. So, you know, those impacts are there as well, even though they're not part of that 1366 number. So just wanted council to be aware that it's it's more than just that number there. Okay, we'll get into just really quick the, the FEMA modeling components. Uh, more acronyms for you. ADSER, this is the co it's, uh, advanced circulation model, ADSER. It's the coastal and, coastal and estuary flooding uh, map, I mean uh, model. It's for the entire coast of North Carolina. The HECRAS, this is the Hydraulic Engineering Center River Analysis System. This is for rivers and creeks. Uh, it's, it's a completely separate component, and it's, it's a much simpler model than the ADSERC. The ADSERC is, is very in-depth and uh, difficult. Yeah, well, it just it takes a lot of power. And out of those four terabytes of data that we had to review based on the, the, the modeling in this area, most of the terabytes of data were related to ADSERC. Uh, SWAN, that's uh, shallow waves uh, near shore, and that's the, a wave model, and that's for the coastal, coastal and estuarine area, and that's not just for wave heights, but there's also like a, a wave setup, which is another component that can increase BFEs, and then there's the WAFIS, that's the Wave Hazard Analysis Flood Insurance Study, something like that. It's the, that's the V zone, A zone model that's used along the coast. And again, it's not uh, relevant for Jacksonville because we have no, there are no V zones in this area. So we, we're not going to get, we're really going to concentrate on, on these two models because these, these are the models that are responsible for the, the, the majority of the BFEs in this area. Here's. Uh, this is the ATSERC model. You can see, you know, it's, it's the entire coast. Jacksonville is right there and in, kind of in the center of the coast, but it's kind of near the boundary, the, the boundary of the, 
the inland boundary of the model is about, is about the 40 to 50 foot contour. Uh, this is an image of the surge where you can see along the coast there's about a 10 foot surge. Uh, it gets up to 11 right inside here. It, 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 as it travels up the estuary, it, it goes down a little bit. There's an 8 foot and then there's a 9 and then there, it's back up to 10. Uh, and that's where Jacksonville is right there. Yes, the and then top. Jacksonville's up in this area. That's the downtown Jacksonville area. Here's a, for the ADSERC, they used six validation storms. Four of them were hurricanes slash tropical storms, and two were nor'easters. And the one of particular note is Hurricane Fran in 1996. Uh, and that was the one that really, you know, had a, a significant effect uh, for the Jacksonville area. It was probably about a 75-year storm. It wasn't quite the 100-year, but about 75. And then this is the... Uh, after they validated the model and were confident in the modeling results, they went and ran 675 artificial storms. And you can see, obviously, this is North Carolina underneath all these storms. So they ran 675 storms of varying strength to develop the 100-year and 500-year storm, con storm conditions. And here's Hurricane Fran. We have some animations, I think, in order just to make in interest of time. We'll, we won't show any animations, but Ryan has some animations of kind of the area in this area getting flooded. But you can see this is a downtown region again, and it's getting, there's about uh, a flood elevation of about eight feet uh, in this area. So this whole area was, during Fran, and, and this is, we were talking with Ryan and other people about the extent of the flooding during Hurricane Fran here uh, 20 years ago. And it really, the, the flooding that the model shows seems to significantly overpredict the flooding that actually occurred by anywhere between four, you know, three or four feet. Uh, here's a, that, a zoom in of that area. And so everything, Wardola Drive, uh, Court Street, uh, Court Street Park, it, this, is, this is all underwater, under eight feet of water. Uh, and so... It, uh, we complained, and Ryan and, and myself, we have been interacting with the NCFMP staff, and we'll get in a little bit more, actually, into the, some of these NFIP claims, but a little later. But basically, we think the Hurricane Fran model run is, is significantly over-predicting the, the, the flooding elevations in the area. Uh, insurance implications. Uh, here again is, this is uh, the LIDAR data, 2006 LIDAR that they used. The bluer colors are lower elevations, the redder colors are good high elevations. Uh, and then this is that 10 foot contour line and uh, right along here. And this is where that AE 10 zone is. So I'm basically they just follow that. Uh, there are a lot of structures and, and Ryan did the counts, but there are a lot of structures in this uh, AE zone and these structures, I, I mean, I have a house in an AE zone, but it's, it's uh, I think it's plus one in, 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 in uh, insurance industry parlance. It's not that bad. Insurance, AE zone flood insurance isn't that bad. It's about a tenth of what VE zone insurance is. But when you get into those negative elevations uh, where you're having these homes that are non-conforming to the base flood elevation, the, the, the insurance premium skyrocket. Mm -hmm. And so, the, actually, you see a few little islands of uh, where that are above 10 feet, but somehow they got mapped, and that's usually do with mapping resolution, where the, the you know FEMA and the, their partners are mapping just huge areas, and they they don't want to get every little area; they just kind of broad strokes. Uh, that's basically the Sturgeon City Hill and the Sturgeon City area. And so, the Hill Cemetery. Yeah. So, and here, this is a. Uh, I talked with uh, Spencer Rogers. Spence, excuse me, Spencer Rogers with NCC Grant, and he uh, has he does a lot of work with uh, post hurricane damage and insurance uh, premiums and that sort of thing. And he developed this figure. The V zone we don't really have to worry about here, but the AE zone we do have to worry about. And you can see here's that the uh, the zero. So basically, if you're in the positive, or if you're in an AE zone and you're constructing and you 
get above that BFE. The A zone insurance premiums are usually, you know, between five hundred and a thousand dollars, and they're not outrageous, but mm -hmm. you you can usually live with them. But as soon as you get into the negatives, you can see that the they're you know they're you're above ten thousand dollars pretty quickly. Uh, you know, right around the negative four, you're at ten thousand. Negative four, negative five, you can it, it gets very expensive. Now, FEMA does have a couple mechanisms to deal with that. And now, just to step back, I'm not an insurance agent, but I, we do a lot of this insurance-related uh, uh, kind of dealing with FEMA and everything. Different insurance agents can interpret these rules differently, and we've encountered a lot of insurance agents where they have widely varying knowledge. On, on flood zones and, and policies and grandfathering and preferred <laughs> risk policies. But the preferred risk policies, these are policies that they say, okay, you're newly mapped into an uh, AE zone. We're going to give you a break you got on this, on your policy because, you know, we're... but these policies can increase 18% a year until they're the actual rate that you should be. So they will give you a break there at the beginning. But if you're a negative five, every year you can count on an 18% increase in that premium until it reaches that actual premium cost. Now there's grandfathering. Now if you're in an AE3 zone right now along the, along the estuary, you can get grandfathered and keep that AE3 policy and pay that AE3 rate. And then you, if you sell your house, you can also transfer that policy. That's a transferable policy. So if you are an AE3 or AE4, you, and there are some caveats to that. If you have multiple flood claim losses, uh, there's some other ones where they'll, they'll <laughs> revoke your grandfathering. Uh, but uh, in general, you, you're, you're not bad. I have also seen some areas where if you can buy, if you're in an X zone now, they usually steer you towards the preferred risk policies. But I have read some... Uh, FEMA material that says if you're in an X zone, you can right now go buy X zone flood insurance, and that can also be grandfathered. So that is another. If uh, we would, you know, highly recommend that, or even look into that even more, uh, because obviously, if you can get grandfathered as an X zone and kind of avoid this, uh, all the premiums based on two hundred fifty thousand dollar value. Yes, for this chart, yeah. this particular chart. So you're seeing somebody that's sitting in downtown in an X zone yes. now could see this map, run out, buy a policy, and be locked in. Yes, that from what I've read, yes. Oh, okay. uh, and again, you you might go to five different insurance agents, and they might you might get five different stories. But from what I've read, I I I believe that is what what the case is. Uh, structures affected. We just uh, did a little analysis in GIS based on the structures in the city uh, with the new zones and the old zones. Uh, the existing AE zone, they're about approximately, uh, and this is based on NCFMD, uh, FMP structure data, and the city's data is actually more accurate, but uh, so Ryan could probably get a, a, maybe a a better number, a little more accurate number. This is approximations. There's 323 structures in the AE zone right now. For the preliminary, there'll be 987, and I think, Ryan, you just, you said 1,366 in your calcs earlier? Yeah, the, um, the state reported 500, the Jacksonville had 500 and This is from the chart that they shared at, in New Bern back in December and also recently 509 current structures and proposed would be 1366. So that's what, 840 some, 50 some houses being okay. added. So back to here. So there's, you know, a significant amount of structures are being affected by the new maps. Uh, and here's just a preliminary versus existing for the downtown area. The, the uh, red triangles are kind of the new structures that are, will be newly mapped into an AE zone. Uh, 
and then while the the green triangles are the existing homes that will go from an AE three or four to an AE ten. Uh, okay, now we're out of the ad surf area, and these are that there are some other areas in the city that also uh, saw some pretty significant increases that are likely that that you know don't look kind of don't they don't pass the walking around test. Uh, this is the Carolina Forest, and this is uh, the Hecraz model, and this is a small riverine model. And you can see these are the elevations right here. So we're talking about, you know, 28, 30 feet, 25 feet. So these are all well away from any kind of coastal storm surge, which was about 10 feet. This is all river related, related to the watersheds and everything like that. And you can see there are some structures all up in here. In, in Carolina Forest, that you know, it's a spot where that seems you know should be dry. It's nowhere near the estuary. It's 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 a very small. It's a relatively small creek, but you can see there are homes all, all along here that that are going to be you know into an AE zone now. And another example is at uh, Bell Fork, and you can see <clears throat> there's some structures. We're uh, along here. That's my house. That, uh, <laughs> that, that, are, that will be affected. And you can see that the elevations here, about 33 feet or so, these are well away from kind of the estuary, the storm surge flood, flooding. This is all related to uh, riverine and watershed flooding. Uh -huh. uh, here's another one. And this is really weird, too. Just the way they, they, the FEMA kind of just cut it off right here. Uh, that just looks really strange. And actually, Ryan uh, brought this up with them, and uh, we'll talk a little bit later about kind of ways to appeal the maps. But uh, just, just that, that looks really strange where they just kind of stopped the study. And, uh, but you can see all these structures here, up in here, <laughs> and just what, what we saw, that all those uh, red triangles that are, that are newly mapped into, uh, into the AE zone. And so there's a lot of structures along this area. Okay, so that's the Belfort Combs area, just mm -hmm. to orient everybody. Okay, potential appeal item. As, as we talked about, the uh, Im improved topographic data. That's kind of an easier one. LiDAR data is much better than what they had 10 or 20 years ago, but it's still not as good as survey data. Survey data is more accurate. And in general, doing our analysis, there was some scatter around that half a foot increase. But we also found that the same thing for when we worked with Wrightsville, is that the survey data is just superior. And a lot of times, the, the LiDAR data, they get a little conservative with their processing of it to make sure it's a little lower than it, than it should be. Uh, the other potential appeal is the ADCIRC model, where we could rerun that. We'd have to calibrate and rerun that. And then the third is rerunning individual creek Heckrass models, and that would be on a creek by creek basis. And and the folks of the state have told us that they're not going to rerun the model regardless of, you know, if we said, hey, we found this, they've said they're not going to rerun it. They're going to look to the municipality to hire a, a firm to rerun the model, which, you know, is is time and costly. Is time extensive and costly? So, and this was the analysis that Ryan was talking, the, the Onslow County Justice Complex, there was a significant amount of survey data, and we took that and we compared it directly with the LIDAR data, and we found that half a foot uh, difference uh, in aver on average. Uh, for ADSERC, we'd have to kind of snip out a grid that included kind of the New River Inlet and that estuary system, and basically, uh, validate that model and we're assuming basically there's bottom friction along that the entire estuary are they letting too much water in? it looks like the tide signal might be a little higher than it should be so it almost like looks like they might be putting too much water into the estuary at the inlet and even the boundary effect of the river where the bound the river the, the model boundary is kind of just a you know about five miles up river of Jacksonville, where there could be some some pi some additional piling up of water around Jacksonville, there there are different ways to do it, uh, but and we could also the the bathymetry and the topography uh, 
we've already covered the topography, but bathymetry, you know, the charts they used and things are, you know, it can be r relatively old. And they probably, they, a lot of times for the Adsec, they're concentrating on, along the coast. Uh, and you can even see that with this uh, validation. Besides kind of the buoys and things where they're validating along the coast, they had uh, HWN, HWMs, which are high water marks. And you can see up here, there's, there are no high water marks up here uh, near Jacksonville. Uh, so they really didn't, and even, even along kind of, they really concentrated along the coast in the barrier islands and just inside the barrier islands. And there's really no validation model back here. So they kind of ran it and they looked at all the validation they had along the coast and the model does pretty well along the coast, even though the, you know, it's, it's, it's better in some spots, worse in others. But you know, that's, that's, you know, it, the Jacksonville area didn't get much attention during this validation. And obviously all those 675 model runs are based on the validation. Didn't you state in uh, some conversations that you and I had that there was, this was off in Wilmington or was that another? Yes, no, it was off in Wilmington. It did a pretty good job in, up, <coughs> up here in the Moorhead area, but yeah, it was, it was also off by a couple feet in, in Wilmington and, and up the uh, Cape Fear River. Uh, here's another example of during Hurricane Fran at the, the USO building along Riverview. Uh, this one image, I, this is an image from uh, about a, it's, it's not, the next day. yes, right, you can, it's nice out, nice blue skies. But that kind of follows the four foot contour, okay? And so oh. it looks like maybe the high water mark, and according to their model, that this whole building should have, <laughs> would have been underwater, it would have been, you know, this is the, the flood, step here, it was up there. Uh, and that's the same thing, so we, we brought this up with NF, the NF, uh, NCFMP, and they pulled uh, National Flood Insurance uh, claims from Hurricane Fran. And so all these red triangles now are, are, are flood insurance claims following Fran. And so they said, well, look, we've got a 15.7 and a 10.8. You know, there was a lot of water during Fran in this area. But as you can see, it was, really, it was mostly right along the, sh the, 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 the shoreline. Uh, and then there were a few little areas up this creek, but uh, 33 out of the 35 points that they pulled those claims, they were uh, about five feet or less. So that kind of says that, okay, maybe the, the, you know, it wasn't eight feet, it was five feet. Where the, 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 and uh, then there are these, there was a couple outliers, but when talking with Ryan, these, they might have had basements. Uh, no, both, both of those did have basements. Okay, they have basements. So, you know, that uh, grade elevation of 15.7, 10.8 doesn't matter if they have a basement. So it really looks like, according to our, the, the claims that when we look at them, it looks like about a five foot surge when, when the model is saying there's an eight. And see, this is again where the, the hurricane friend, this is the model output from AdCERC saying that this entire area got wet. And you can see those NFIP claims are sporadically in that area, but you know, uh, it, uh, I think we believe there would have been a lot more claims if, you know, if, if the model had really is, is accurately showing the hurricane frame results. So summary. Uh, Let me yep, ask a question ahead. on that. So even if they didn't have flood insurance, they would still track that there was a claim here for flooding? Is that how that works? Do what, FEMA? Like uh, the, you're talking about, like these homes up here, right? They were very uh, private with those NFIP claims. They wouldn't let us see them, as you, as you recall. Yeah, uh, that is uh, an interesting uh, idea. I, yeah, I'm not sure because obviously, yeah, those homes are not in the, the flood zone, and you know they always say that 20% well, of the flood insurance claims are outside of flood zones. So I'm not sure how that how that works. I guess we need to kind of confirm whether you would think that all of these houses would have had flood insurance claims mm -hmm. if if there was that much water. And oh. from everybody that I've spoken to and in, in my own recollection, the water was not that high. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it wasn't that. High. Mm -hmm. Right.
Right. And, and I believe these, some of these claims, especially those interior claims, are FEMA claims, but these people did not have private flood insurance. But when it's declared a major uh, mm -hmm. disaster, then FEMA comes in, sets up their office, mm -hmm. and you deal. Mm -hmm. That's where they're getting some of their points okay. on the map, I would believe, not from people having private flood insurance up at that end of Court Street, okay. et cetera. Right. Mr. King, is there any recourse for um, homeowners that is – if – if they do not wish to purchase um, flood insurance, is there a recourse that they can take to determine whether or not if their house is actually in a floodplain zone, you know, such as um, hiring, if they had the funds to do it, to hire a surveyor to come in and to survey their land to determine the elevation and based upon those findings, determine whether or not if they need to purchase flood insurance basically the folks along court street they will be notified if they have that federally insured mortgage that you are now going to be in a flood zone you have to obtain insurance but that that's only <coughs> if that person has a mortgage what if that person house is outright paid for and they don't have a mortgage they don't have to get insurance then that's their personal <coughs> preference as i understand it mm -hmm. so if that person is notified, the first thing that they will need to do is they would need to basically seek out a surveyor to perform what's called an elevation certificate. And what that's going to do is that's going to establish their finished floor elevation of their house and where the ground is. And that's going to let them know are they above the base flood or below. And based on that, they would turn that in to their mortgage company if they're above and the mortgage company should basically say, okay, the house is out of the flood zone. You don't have to have flood insurance, but if it's below, how much it costs? <laughs> well, I, I, approximately mm -hmm. survey. Well, so so don't put them on. The, I've I've been told that an elevation will certificate <laughs> will range between three and four hundred dollars and eight or nine hundred dollars. So that's so, still a, fi a financial right. economic burden to the homeowners. Right. So once this is done, let's say that you know five or six or seven hundred people. That's they're going to be their first step is to seek an elevation certificate to see where their house really sits as it relates to the base flood elevation zones. And then from that, they're going to say, okay, well, my house is now a negative two. From that, they will then seek flood insurance based on that minus two, and that may cost them $5,000 a year. There, there is another form. It's called the letter of map flood map determination form have you, have you there yes. it's it's a, it's a little bit simpler but if you are in an ae 10 zone i think you you will be required but sometimes you're right along the edge or you're in, in along a creek or something sometimes you can just get a, a simpler one which is usually sometimes a, a town or well let me give you an example in fact he he called me this afternoon i returned his call didn't get up with him but uh, a gentleman that lives on Jasmine Lane called me about three or four weeks ago. He was trying to refinance, uh, Aragona Village, off of Wido, NRETJ. Mm -hmm. He was trying to refinance his home. Mm -hmm. And the mortgage, the, the lender basically seeks a firm to let them know, is it or isn't it in a flood zone? Well, part of the lot that backs up to the creek is in an AE zone. So they basically told the individual, we're not going to give you a refi, you need to basically go get flood insurance and an elevation certificate. Now, that example that um, that friend just gave you, it, which I steered him in that direction, he should be able to go to that lender and say, but where my home sits, it's actually outside of that special flood hazard area. And the plot plan, site plan that was prepared by the surveyor when the home was constructed shows that the house was proposed to be built outside of the flood zone. So I talked with the surveying company that performed that plot plan and said, hey, look, if this homeowner wants to come have an as-built survey, kind of a foundation survey done, you know, can they do that and about what would that cost? And once again, you know, two to $500 so that they could then turn that into that lender and say, hey, my house is not within that special flood hazard area. Nonetheless, you have some folks that are saying you have to have something when in reality you may not have to, and then that's just time and effort and expense that these homeowners have to go through to try to prove, hey, look, my house, the structure's not in the flood zone. 
So. But they may still have a situation where the mortgage company says, no, we're not going to, it doesn't matter. Yeah, we're, that's the issue. We're I've, not, heard, we're issue. Not, we're not I've heard that's the case, too, that if any part of your lot is in, you know, you'll have the mortgage company saying you have to have flood insurance. Now, I don't know if there's any recourse there where FEMA gets involved, because I've kind of heard that FEMA would get involved and say, no, you, it's well, not mandatory. The other problem that you have is that you can have completely out some of these companies that they already they charge $20 and it's close they're going to say is in. Then you got to argue with the determination agency and document to them and get them swayed. That's another problem that we face. And they just, what they're doing, they said somewhere in California or Texas, <laughs> most of them are done. And they said if it's close, they're going to call it in. And then you got to prove them it's not in. So it's not clear cut. Based on your <clears throat> presentation, you've raised several questions about the accuracy of the new limits compared to 2005. On the appeal, what's your best guess in terms of how successful you'll be in an overall picture? Or is that stretching it too far? Uh, well, I think there, there are different components to it. There's the, the answer. Well, let's, let's say the Court Street area, which is the downtown mm -hmm. area, seems to be the hardest yes. hit. You said that FEMA, your friend, Fran's height differs from what they're projecting by a couple feet, I think you said. Yeah, about, maybe about three feet. About three feet, which is significant. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we would have to... Basically, okay, I, I'll, I'll get into that. Uh, for the, the summary, basically, uh, FEMA, I guess, has money set aside for gauge installation. It would probably be a good idea, and it wouldn't help on this round of maps, but the next round of maps, uh, gauge data somewhere around here, water level gauge data, would help out tremendously in the future. And FEMA supposedly has money set aside for gauge installation. And then even talking with NCC grant, uh, they also can find some grants for that as well. Uh, improved topography. Uh, the Bell Fork homes, they're now there's 2015 LIDAR out that shows that that Bell Fork area should not be in uh, a special flood hazard area. So they, uh, NCFMP staff have already said, you can file an appeal and cite the 2015 ladder data. You don't even need survey data. And you can say this area is incorrectly mapped. Here's the 2015 LIDAR data. So, and then besides that, you have a LOMA letter map amendment and LOMA, LOMAR uh, letter map revision based on fill, that's the F. And then we'll get into ADSERC modeling and HECRAS modeling. Uh, LOMA potential, that this, this is that 10 foot <coughs> contour line. These are in uh, this is in the AE 10 zone, but there's some islands of 10 foot or higher elevations. You can go to a surveyor and get a letter of map amendment. Uh, that's individually uh, and, and working with a surveyor. Uh, and then the letter of map revision, if you ever say you were, oh, your house was maybe right here, or you were maybe a couple feet <coughs> below that, you could possibly do, a let, you can do a letter of map revision based on fill where you, it's a little longer uh, process because you have to kind of turn in stuff saying, I'm going to put in one or two feet of fill here to get out of the, the flood zone. But you have to prove that you're not adversely affecting your neighbors. Uh, and then besides that, the ADSERC model, we, we basically snip out a portion of the grid and then we'd have to validate the model. Uh, and the validation data, uh, if anyone has knows of any good validation data during Hurricane Fran, that would be great. But otherwise, we could put in uh, a few gauges temporarily for about a, a month near the inlet, maybe somewhere in the mid estuary up near Jacksonville, and and then we could we'd have real data to calibrate the model, and then we could run Hurricane Fran. And then we could actually run those 675 storms. Then we'd have to post process the data and find the 100 year and the 500 year and kind of remap the area, the study area. Uh, and we'd coordinate with FEMA and, and um, you know, SC, NCFMP, you know, the, the entire way. Uh, 
you know, I think we can bring that those values down, the surge levels down, at least you know a foot or two. Uh, could could it be three or four feet, possibly? Uh, FEMA, you know, as long as we kind of stick to their protocol and use their models and their process, uh, they're usually flexible in that. But you know, even talking with with the FEMA staff, they're like, if you fix the bathymetry that could potentially make the surge worse in this area. So obviously there's, there's some, and obviously we don't want that. Uh, so th there, there are some areas that we have to be very careful with when we're, remod if we're remodeling this. And this is a you know, pretty significant effort, you know, 675 models you know, running that. This, is a, this whole thing was done by RENCI, which is a Renaissance Computing Institute, and it's based <coughs> at Duke, UNC, and NC State. And they've got a supercomputer that they run this on. Uh, and obviously, I think we could coordinate with them. And we, we're, you know, we know a few of those professors who work there. But you know, we're tasked with rerunning their models. Uh, the HECRAS modeling is a little simpler uh, because those, those little creek models are very simple. They're based on like 1980s Fortran programs. Uh, they're a little bit easier, and we can you know, re resubmit the LIDAR for the, for the Belfort error, which is very easy. You don't even have to rerun the, the HECRAS model. But for the other models, we'd have to just you know, check them, check their topography, and, they just, uh, and, and just any creeks that, that we see that just the results don't look reasonable, we could you know, go, to, go that route. And, and that's pretty much that's the, my last slide. And then uh, I guess Ryan and Glenn are going to talk a little bit more. I've got a question. Then. Sure. <clears throat> you said you were successful appealing the Bryceville Beach. Yes. Define success. How that? What you get? We remapped. We remapped about. Uh, I think it was almost about 600 acres that was supposed to be V zone, <coughs> and we remapped as as, as A zone. So, um, and that's kind of what they wanted to do. Actually, because along the the, the beach. It was actually very favorable, as we said, the, the storm surge was going down. But then the waves, as soon as they got over, the, they got into Harbor Island, which is the estuarine area, again, the estuarine area, there was there were some VE zones that just didn't make any sense. And so then we had to run that, the WAFIS wave model, and kind of prove, and work. we worked with FEMA, and they're usually pretty flexible on this, and, and we worked with them to, to remap the, those V zones as A zones. So did you get like half of it out, or uh, we got most of it out. Most of and it. See, but that is a little simpler than the ADCIRC modeling. Uh, the ADCIRC modeling is the most complex component, <coughs> modeling component of the all that FEMA suite of models. And unfortunately, that is the model that is responsible for the BFEs in Jacksonville. So you said earlier we didn't touch the ADCIRC model for Wrightsville. We so just. Yeah, you said earlier that we're looking at a BFE increase of six to seven feet. Yes. So in our case, the success would be three or four feet. Yes, it, it would, would be, still be an increase. Right, right. <clears throat> it's like currently the downtown area, most of it is not in a flood zone, but we know that during certain storms, there may be a foot or two of water in the street. So should it be in a flood zone? It probably should be. I think the question is, should it be a BFE 4 or 5, or should it be a BFE 10? I think that's really the question that it comes down to. I'll also let council know that what we're struggling with here is the same thing that Moorhead City and Carteret County and all the beach communities are facing right now. You know, there's multiple people that are looking into the same situation that we are, or whether to challenge or appeal the maps, hire consultants I know that there's a couple of the small beach towns Pine Knoll Shores and those folks that they were kind of collectively trying to come up and looking at hiring somebody because they had the same concerns I'm not sure how many people are actually going through it but you know this is something that we're all struggling with well, if there's no more immediate questions let us just go to the punch line so that you all can make a decision and give guidance to staff as it was Clearly, he talked about some areas that you would not have expected these flood maps to have such significant impact on. And the downtown area, clearly, if there's people down there that are going to be significantly affected by this that are already residents of this area and can have that impact. And as he indicated on the insurance, if you're in that area where you actually have a negative in, uh, elevation, 
perceived by the fact that it's going to be higher that those potential of looking at a, at a premium that's in the ten thousand dollar range just means as someone said walk away or whatever happens there this is something that um, your citizens certainly um, you know are going to feel an effect from and as we mentioned here's that bell fork area significant in there and we notice now that we have some improved data that is available in there and so um, Richard is making the recommendation to you that you authorize the office to identify an additional scope of work negotiate a fee and then have you consider whether to go forward when you find the information and read that scope of work and that's the recommendation that we put forth this your management team to you I make a motion to authorize it. Second. Second. Third. <laughs> Any other discussion about that motion? Any questions of Mr. Uh, Mr. Way or, or Ryan? I'm assuming the additional scope of work would be the actual appeal or just do we don't, don't know yet? Well, Richard will will lead that process, and one of the concepts is is to identify the work that he has indicated those models and doing things such as that, and then perhaps have that be step one, and then the step two would be then to file those appeals based upon what the data comes back in. Obviously, if the data comes back and we go, whoa, whoa, whoa we're not telling this anybody, you know, then then that all we stop there. But um, you know, that's the deal, you know, so. We, we want to do what's best for the citizens of Jacksonville. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, all opposed? Okay. Thank you, Mayor Thank you. And we just want to say, as the Mayor Pro Tem mentioned, for people watching at home, if they'll go to this website, um, you can see what your home is. Um, in the upper right-hand corner, there is a, um, it says existing, as the maps that are existing at this time, and then you just move it to um, preliminary, which is, has nothing to do with like proposed. I don't know why they use those words, but anyway, they do. And you can watch the blue overtake um, many properties in the city of Jacksonville and that are in areas that surprise you um, in a lot of ways there. All right, that, that effective and preliminary, if you want to come down to City Hall, we can kind of demonstrate a little bit, I believe, clearer to where you can see basically green and red. Red is bad because it's getting bigger and green is good because it's going away versus toggling back and forth while you're waiting for the map to change from preliminary to or from effective to preliminary. So for the citizens at home, we'd be happy to sit down and demonstrate that for you as well. Uh, so if you're anywhere close to the estuary riverine system and you're not sure, please feel free to come down and see us. Well, I think it's uh, incumbent on us to look out for the interests of our citizens, and I think y'all head in the right direction trying to get this appeal across and formulate an appeal. Well, thank you, Council, for your recommendation, and that's all that we have for you this evening. I'll uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, <laughs>